think about why don't we get started? Um, Joan, I actually have to get the remote back from you because I had to start the recording. I always forget to do that. But now the recording is started. Um, so why don't, so before we get started, I'm just gonna share a little bit about who we are as a um, organization and some of the uh, good stuff that we do in case you wanna learn more. So um, let's kind of get started. Uh, Joan, you wanna advance to the next slide? Why don't you, why don't you take us through some of these and I'll, I'll kind of give my spiel. Okay, I got it. Never mind, I got it. All right. Wait, who's controlling you or me? I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, so Joan mentioned the Institute for Learning Development. This is our learning center in Lexington, Massachusetts, where we do a lot of great work on executive function directly with students. We work with um, one-to-one -one or in small groups doing EF strategies. We do neuropsych evaluation and support. And that ILD is where a lot of our good work comes that we use in webinars like this. Research ILD is the nonprofit branch of um, the Institutes for Learning and Development. We take all these great strategies and the research and the resources and we share them with the world through webinars like this, through conferences and trainings, through um, chapters and books that, that Joan had mentioned. So go ahead and check out our website, researchild.org. We have some great resources for you. Um, all of our work is really kind of under the umbrella of Dr. Lynn Meltzer, who's kind of our EF guru and fearless leader. Um, she's been working in this field for a long, long time, really focusing on strength-based ways to help students understand themselves as learners and break down the steps of successful learning. Um, a lot of great books. Um, Dr. Meltzer has edited and published a lot of great books. I love that green book. That's my EF Bible. If you haven't read that, I highly encourage that you do. Um, and this, so I think I said this, but this is the last in our spring uh, webinar series. We've had a lot of fun. The three previous ones are all up on the YouTube playlist that I shared earlier. Um, just look us up on YouTube under Smarts Online. You can see the recordings. Um, we've really enjoyed it. We will get the uh, summer calendar up soon. Also, there is a, another training. Dr. Meltzer is leading a training next week on flexible thinking and how to promote flexible thinking in your students, especially important in this time. I do have a $20 off code for you guys. It's good until Sunday. I will post that in the chat later and I will include it in my follow-up email to you later. There's an elementary session next Tuesday and a secondary session next Thursday. So if you'd like to join us, we hope that you will. Um, and then lastly, SMARTS. You know, SMARTS is our executive function strategy instruction curriculum. It's a K-12 resource. You can use it. We have an elementary version, middle school and high school version. We're very lucky to have some SMARTS educators here in the room with us right now. So we'll show you some of the materials um, as, as it kind of fits our theme today. But in your follow-up evaluation, if you'd like to see some of our materials, just check the box and we'll send you a sample lesson that you can explore. Um, yeah, and then our SMARTS website has a lot of great stuff. We also have some free resources for parents we've developed just for this, um, you know, climate that we're dealing with. So feel free to check that out. And, you know, I love to talk about executive function all day long. So feel free to reach out to me directly with your questions as well. And I think that is it. Oh, Joan, I'm going to, so this is me. I'm going to put this survey in, right? Yep. Yes. Okay. So let me give that back to you. I'm going to put a survey in the chat because we want to know um, where you guys are coming from and what you think about a little bit more about math. So go ahead and check out the survey and you're going, you might need to cut and paste it. If it's not an active link, you may need to cut and paste that into your browser. You should see something like, let's take a look at what it's going to look like. Um, so you should be seeing something like this. Uh, we're going to ask you kind of who are you you know what's your role what brings you here today how confident are you in your own math skills and um, how confident are you in your ability to teach math to other people and what are three words that come to mind when you think about math okay so go ahead and um, type those in all right we'll see let's we'll get some responses as they come in awesome all right, let's see who we got. And this is gonna update live. I love this part of Google Forms, a great thing to use when you're doing webinars or any online learning. So look, I love, look how colorful, this is a really colorful one. We're seeing there's a really diverse crowd here today. The biggest one so far is counselors and social workers and psychologists. Congratulations, you guys are winning. Um, but oh my <laughs> gosh, this is great. This is probably the most diverse crowd we've had so far, which is so interesting. Some very confident people when it comes to math. Oh, I like that, I like that a lot. 
Um, okay. And feeling fairly confident in our ability to teach our students too. Although we're seeing a little more color there. So that's a spot that we might want to work on um, uh, today, hopefully with some strategies to feel more confident. And look at some of these words coming in. Fun, order, organization, common core, fun. I love it. Oh, that's great. That's really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to take, you're going to see some live, um, some live work right here to learn about how, I want to show you a little word art. Okay, actually, you know what, John, I might use- A lot of math teachers just vary levels. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I'm actually yeah. going to give you, um, I'm going to give this back to you, Joan. I don't want to waste their time while I do that cloud art. I'll get it ready for later, though. I'll share it next time, okay? So will you take over? Will you reshare the PowerPoint? And will you kick us off, please? Sure. Is that right? I love how, I love everyone's confident on their math. That's great. But if you're not, that's okay, too. Okay. Can you see? Yes, Are I we can on? see it. I think we're good. Okay. Go for it. So that's the word splash that's my, that Michael's going to do. Yeah, I'll share with you later. So in terms of math, these are the, um, just like um, I saw Wendy's webinar for reading, and I know some of you were probably there, just like there's a reading rope that somebody imagined of all the parts of reading that come together, in math, there's also somebody developed this math rope where the conceptual understanding you'll notice is the core. And then around the edges, we have procedural fluency, productive disposition, strategic confidence, adaptive reasoning. Could conceptualize this many different ways. The curriculum has shifted so that now there's a really big emphasis on conceptual understanding rather than procedures although everything um, has comes together to um, make a successful math learner. Um, I wanted to highlight productive disposition. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit more, but another, a more modern way to talk about that is growth mindset or productive struggle that kids have to be kind of willing to take a chance and to know that they're gonna grow as opposed to getting stuck in one way of thinking. So there's a lot of factors that contribute to differences in math achievement. We talked a little about the emotional, and of course there's cognitive factors, including working memory, processing speed, quantitative reasoning, and language skills. And it used to be a long time ago that um, if you had good math skills, but you weren't a good reader, you could be a successful math student. But now there's so much of an integration of reading into the math curriculum that the kids who struggle with reading also struggle with math. So it's, and, and finally, executive function, which is what we're gonna talk about today. But it's a complicated situation with that rope that each strand um, depends on so many different things. So this is the smart way, um, icon or, or visual for executive function. And we look at it as a funnel that can get clogged up and anybody's funnel can get clogged. If you look at what it's like to manage being a teacher um, in the age of Zoom and coronavirus, many of us on a daily basis have clogged funnels. All this information is coming in and our executive function, which is our ability to shift, to organize, to remember things, and to self-monitor ourselves, gets kaflui. For a lot of our students um, with learning issues, this happens with fewer amounts of things coming in, but anybody can have difficulty with executive function, which is, I think, why it hasn't been delineated as an area of disability, but that's a topic for another time. So today we're gonna to focus on cognitive flexibility and organizing and prioritizing. So for flexible thinking, you can put in the chat what you see. This is a very old model of flexibility, but feel free and Michael, you can call out what you see in the chat. Okay. But there's ways to look at it. What do you see? see and what I else see. do you see? There's a chalice, a base, faces, two faces in a base, face, face, Cursive base, two faces, two faces in a base. Okay. 
like a so tongue twister. I had one student who I was trying to get the point across. This is a really good thing to use, by the way, as a concrete representation of flexibility. Um, I had a student who just kept saying, it's not fair. It's not fair that you see two things. It's not fair. And that was really, and I hear that a lot when students, the first time I, I worked with a student on negative numbers and he said, it's not fair. Why didn't they tell us about these a long time ago? It's just not fair that there's another way. And some kids feel like that, but the more they get used to it, the better they can do it. Um, I'm gonna skip this one for now. So how do you think that shifting and flexible thinking impacts math? And you can put your answers for that in the chat. As you can see, I'm used to having interactive conversations with people during um, these things. So Michael, right. let's see. All right, we've got difficulty solving problems in different ways, being able to regroup, different ways to solve problems, solve a problem more than one way, shifting, multiple ways to solve the same problem, different learning styles, new rules for math are introduced all the time, solving multi-steps. Okay, Whew. that's pretty good, good job. Ooh. So things that we've thought about are shifting flexibly between operations when some are addition and some are subtraction and you have to switch. Shifting from one strategy to another. Shifting from the big picture estimate to the details. Going from the details to the larger trends and shifting from words to numbers and back again. And um, and I wanted to do, uh, say a few things about a couple of them. Sometimes kids learn one strategy, for instance, for adding um, integers together. But then when you get to multiplication, the rule is different. But what I've found is they tend to get stuck on one strategy and use it for everything without thinking that the concept is actually different. So according to John Starr at the Harvard Harvard um, School right. of I think is difficult and where our students need a little bit of help. So, um, but students who know more than one method are likely to be more successful in math because there's always another way to solve a problem. So kids that are inflexible, if you've never seen Rock Brain, it's worth looking up the Rock Brain books, which are part of social thinking. And a lot of people like, it's another concrete way to describe being a Rock Brain versus a flexible brain. I think the flexible brain is super flex. <laughs> so if you're inflexible, you might be inefficient. One of my students still, she's in eighth grade, and when she encounters eight minus seven, she still counts backwards seven. And um, on the other hand, she's able to do slope and intercept and Pythagorean theorem, but when it comes to the basics, she still uses an inefficient strategy, but it is one she understands, so it's kind of a double-edged thing. Um, they misread operation signs. They insist on incorrect procedures, like if you use learn two negatives, make a positive, that means every time they see two negatives, whether it's subtraction, addition, multiplication, or whatever, um, they over overuse it and they get stuck and give up. But for students with learning differences, flexibility takes a lot of time to develop and a lot of compromise. I let my students use some inefficient strategies if they're getting the right answers and it's working for them because that's the one that attaches to the concept for them. So there's a lot of scaffolding required and I'm gonna change it back to Michael to talk about the zone of proximal development. Excellent. Um, so if you've watched any of our, um, if you watch any of our webinars so far, you've seen us talk about this issue, this idea of the zone of proximal development. All skills, all skills that we have as humans develop um, in this developmental progression, right? I always think about tying your shoes. Like when kids are really little, they can't tie their shoes yet. So we do it for them. Then as they become, you know, they got the motor coordination, they understand the point of it, they can kind of sequence a little better. We teach them rhymes and games and this and that to do it. And then they do it enough times and they can do it independently. 
And executive function is no different when it comes to organizing your time or being able to shift flexibly between different tasks. Um, executive function also has a developmental progression, but it's very important. So whenever we do these trainings, someone will come up to us and say something like, what should a seven-year-old be able to do? What should a 17-year-old be able to do? And it's very important for us to put that question back on people because a lot of the should depends on the context that they're being put in. So um, can you go to the next slide? Next slide, please, Joan. Um, so we're going to ask you to answer that question. I'm actually going to put another survey in the chat and I'm going to ask you to kind of vote on what should a student be able to do across a, a certain math task. And I think the task we chose was work with fractions flexibly because uh, some people, and hopefully this won't surprise you, but some people are afraid of fractions. Some of our students are afraid of fractions. So let me show you what this is supposed to look like and um, we'll see what you think. So here it is, what can our students do? So five-year-olds, should five-year-olds be able to solve fractions with fractions? problems with fractions. Nine-year-olds, should they be able to solve problems with fractions? 13-year-olds and 17-year-olds. So I want you to just open this up and vote. And let's take a look at these responses. So, okay, here we go. Um, so five-year-olds, yeah, they can't do, look at that. Most people are saying they can't do fractions, but some people are saying they can. And some people are even saying they can do it independently, which is so interesting. But look at that big leap from five to nine. Now a lot of us are saying, yes, as long as we support a nine-year-old, a nine-year-old can do fractions. Look at the 13-year-old one. A lot of people are saying, yes, 13-year-olds should absolutely be able to do fractions, okay? And then look at the 17-year-old. Almost all of us are saying a 17-year-old should be able to do fractions independently, right? So you're seeing that developmental progression that we expect as kids get older, they can do fractions totally independently, which is really, really interesting. Um, okay, let me give it, so I think I'm gonna give it back to you now, Joan, right? Yep. All right, you can go ahead and take that away. Fractions are our friends. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but some, and I don't know if anybody else who teaches high school sees that there are high school students taking pre-calculus that still are not really fluent with the fact that X over X is one or with how to manipulate fractions and need that support still. So Michael, um, uh, so in this, this is a zone of proximal development. So as teachers, when we're in the orange zone with students, that's like an appropriate level of challenge. We're supporting them, we're giving them scaffolding, we're giving them explicit strategies to build their confidence. When they can do it independently, that's in the green zone here, when they're easily, when they can easily do what you're asking them to do. And the more time, uh, and in the red zone, it means they really can't do it yet, even with support. So sometimes for my students who have learning challenges in math, the curriculum is operating at kind of out here. And they really need help to get, uh, they need some modifications and flexibility on the part of the teacher to perhaps differentiate so that they're in here, and then they need some support to get there because out here is too fast and too much, but in here is where their zone of proximal development is. And I think as a teacher, it's hard for us to know the zone of proximal development for all the kids in our class, but it's helpful as a, um, also when you're operating in the red zone, your anxiety goes up. And so then there gets to be a con, um, and when people are anxious, they really can't be flexible. You have to be calm in order to be flexible. If you're trying to operate in the red zone, it's very difficult to be relaxed, and then it's very difficult to be flexible. When the task is within the zone, you have a much better chance of meeting students in a place where their emotions haven't taken over. Once the emotions take over, you kind of have to quit and come back later because it's very difficult to teach anybody anything when they've shut down. So what can we do to, um, to um, encourage flexibility? The first thing is be flexible ourselves and understand what I just said about people with VPD. The other thing that you can do in the classroom is to use tasks with multiple approaches that are low bar, high ceiling, or open-ended. 
and to use multiple representations to model concepts and give the students some choice in which strategies meet their learning styles and which ones they'd like to choose. So by low bar, high ceiling, I mean tasks that give the students who are struggling or who are the more, have a more concrete interpretation, they can be included and successful also. At the same time, those tasks are good for students who are more sophisticated and more able to approach the task at an abstract level. The students who are approaching it at a higher level become models for students who are approaching it at a more concrete level, but it's okay whichever level you're at. Um, I noticed lately that my middle school, Lexington Middle School for math is doing choice boards. So nine possible choices, they have to pick three to do. And the way that gives the students the power to pick things that meet their metacognitive understanding of their own learning style and also um, satisfy the needs of the curriculum. Um, another thing that I see people um, doing really successfully is giving the students, calling uh, their assignments mild, medium, and spicy, rather than easy, medium, and hard. Because mild, medium, and spicy, there's no judgment. Also, the kids are being given the choice of what to do, the mild, the medium, or the spicy. And it's just about what your taste is on that day. And then some kids will need a push to go from mild to medium, but that's okay. Or some kids might be told, try the mild one, do those well, and then go on to the medium one. So some of the tasks that I've learned about are uh, which one doesn't belong, three-act math, and numberless word problems. Most of my knowledge comes from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics conferences. If anybody, I'm sure a lot of you have been there. If you haven't been to one, it's worth going. They're not focused very specifically on students who struggle with executive function or struggle with anything. So if you implement these tasks with kids that struggle, it's good to pick something within their zone. So you might choose an activity that's a grade lower. So here's an example. Um, of a task called which one doesn't belong and why. And this is, um, I'm gonna show you a couple of these. If you're doing them with a class, each person has to pick a different answer. So there's no one right answer. So you might have a student that picks the shaded in triangle and just says because it's shaded in. Then you might have a higher ceiling student who might say, well, this is the only, the one on the top left is the only isosceles triangle using that language and modeling it for the other student. This is another one and I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat which one doesn't belong and why, and I'm gonna ask Michael to read out some of the answers. Okay. Uh, 43, is, 43 is not a perfect square, 16 it's even. Nine, it's a one digit number. You guys are smart. 16 is even, <laughs> nine single digits, 16 is the only even one, 43. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you Perfect. guys weren't kidding. So, on those as math you can scores. see, there's multiple responses and multiple answers, and they're all correct. And some require more math vocabulary than others, and some require more math knowledge, but you can use this over a wide range of students. And that's why it's a low bar, high ceiling task. And that's also why it promotes flexible thinking because any answer is right. There's not a certain right answer. Another set of these are um, uh, notice and wonder or three act math tasks. And I'm gonna play this for you. I'm hoping you'll be able to hear it. And if you can, it's okay. We can hear it.
So that's act one. And I'd like you to put this in the chat also. What did you notice? And Michael, you can feel free to repeat anything you see. Okay, five packages, four bags of Whoppers, three bags went in, multiple bags, four packages, how many bags it took to fill it. There is still space in the container. He put in more than one bag. Um, multiple bags went in, Great. many bags of Whoppers. Great. So what we usually ask students for this is, what do you notice? And for some students, it's okay if they say um, the guy had a watch on or that he tapped three times on the top or that the counter is brown. Anything is okay as a, as a notice question, I mean answer. And then you say, what do you wonder? What math questions could you ask about this? And I'd like you to put some of those in the chat too. Okay, let's see. How many in the jar? How many Whoppers in the jar? Um, estimate how many Whoppers, how many, how many bags? How many in all? Great. Is it full? So we how many parts to hold? Some, good. Somebody, sometimes kids will say, how much does it weigh? And then we say, what we're going to focus on for today, those are all great questions, is how many Whoppers are in the jar? There we go. So, and then um, act two actually gives them the um, answers to what do you need to know? Like how many, how many packages were there and how many are on each package? And then in small groups or with you or alone, they get to figure out how many Whoppers are in the jar. And then there's a great reveal, act three reveals everything. So first of all, they're fun. Um, there's one that, um, uh, how many times could somebody, oh, the record winning Guinness Book World of Records, how many times this guy clapped in one minute. And um, it really shows them giving him the Guinness Award at the end. It's very cool. So what makes these high, low bar, high ceiling? Like I said, you could have any kinds of questions being asked, any kinds of notice. And so um, in that way, everybody's responses are equally valuable. Whoop. Wait a minute, I think I missed one. Good, so a third way to increase flexibility, flexible thinking is to use numberless word problems. So often when kids see a word problem with two numbers, they add them. No matter what they've learned before, they still add them. And one way to take that out of it and take the one right answer out of it is to take the numbers out and present the problem like this one. Some girls entered a school art competition, fewer than boys, fewer boys than girls entered the competition. And you can say whatever math you want that entered that's in this problem. Well, the boys were less than the girls, the girls were more than the boys. I wonder how many there were all together. Um, I wonder if one person was allowed to um, do more than one art project. You could you have a general discussion about it. On the numberless word problems website, they then add in the numbers on the next slide and then or add in one number and then add another number but it's student-centered because the student is creating the question and that encourages interest and flexibility in shifty math we have a similar strategy um, which is melissa bought 10 new songs on i can't read it on itunes carrie bought 12 new songs and malik bought 20. you figure out what questions could you ask so again, it's promoting the shifting from one question to another, and it's also low bar, high ceiling, and it also encourages flexibility. So um, you could also say, what if the answer is Carrie? What was the question? What if the answer is eight? What was the question? And all these kind of ways, um, that's meant to encourage cognitive flexibility. The, another, um, good flexibility math strategy and also a way for kids to integrate reading and math is doing compare contrast 
um, problems. So for instance, these two problems are very similar, um, except they have different questions. So the one on the left says, how many bananas did he pick? The one on the right says, how many more bananas did he pick in the afternoon? So you're encouraging students to look beyond the numbers and to look at actually the words and what's the same and one's, what's different. And you'll notice on this problem, there's a reflection question at the bottom. SMARTS is very big on reflection and on having kids reflect on what they did. So what do you notice is the same? What do you notice is different? Sketch it and solve it. And you'll notice that on this, they use the, um, the bar um, representation. There are a lot of different representations you could use for your sketch. This is one that's very popular in Singapore math, I know, and um, maybe other ways too. But, and then you can see the reflection. One problem is asking how many more, so you subtract. The other problem is asking for the whole, so we added. That's a very nice explanation. Another way to shift is thinking about how, how what representation means the most to you or what representation of the same concept um, resonates with you the best. For instance, I find that that um, part over whole equals percent over 100 is perfect for a lot of my students. And it works a little bit better than the visual representations, but some people like the visual representations better. This is multiple ways to um, represent integers. And I'd like you to look at these and put in the chat what your favorite way is for learning about integers, negative and positive numbers, either now or when you learned it before, when you were little, what resonated with you and got you to really understand the concept. And it's gonna be different for everybody probably. Ooh, so we're seeing a lot of number lines. Uh, someone talked about using different colors, which I like, thermometer, football, um, visual Let's see it's not a really good one i'm trying to find it oh a line graph yeah 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 um number line is winning oh money yeah that's interesting too okay great thank you guys terrific and i have students who actually like the rules once they've got the concept they like to focus on the rules because a lot of students who struggle with math struggle with visual spatial processing. And for those kids, the more linear it is, and that way the number line is really good. And the more verbal it is, the more they grab onto it. And the more abstract visuals aren't so good for them. And finally, it, to, to increase flexibility and acceptance of all different strategies, it's helpful for teachers to have a strategy board have one bulletin board for kids to post different strategies that work for them. And um, for you to have students on tests or assessments have a box that is a reflection, what strategy worked best for you? Because that encourages the reflection, it encourages flexibility, and it also gives them points for it, meaning that you are putting value on the process not just the content. So the more value you put on the process and the strategies and the understanding themselves through metacognition, the more the students will learn to value those things as well. I might be preaching to the choir, but since I can't check, I assume that a lot of you were doing that. <laughs> and now we go on. Uh, so does anybody have any questions before we go on to organization? Um, well, one question that came up that I think you've been addressing kind of um, under the radar, but it's something about like how these strategies are important for kids on the autism spectrum. And I feel like that flexibility piece is really, really so, so important. Um, do you it's anything? very difficult for kids on the autism spectrum. I feel like you have to go very gently. I feel like it's like you have to push, um, I'll put my hands up, push on the, like if it's a balloon, you're like, pushing a little bit on the edges of their inflexibility so that they can stay with what they know and you just push them with your questions a tiny bit beyond their comfort zone at a time. 
And when you see them falling off the edge, you go back to where they're comfortable. It's slower, but it works. That's right. Anything else come up in the questions? Um, people have shared some really great ideas and people are also talking about how this can really be integrated, you know, as a kind of a tier one thing, like weaving this into all math instruction, which I love that. Um, no other major, major questions that I'm seeing right now. Okay, we're gonna go on to um, organization and prioritization. So when you get into complex calculations and problem solving, of course, a lot of it is multi-step procedures. And when I get calls for parents who want help for their students, not just with math, kind of across the board, they often say they have trouble with multi-step processes. And these rely heavily on attention, working memory, long-term memory for rules, and the ability to keep the goal in mind. A lot of kids get lost on the way to the answer. So these are all really common and very difficult, especially when the curriculum is moving so fast. So this little guy, I like this little guy. He's the, our executive function conundrum, where he doesn't know where to start. He doesn't follow the steps. He just guesses a lot, and he doesn't know what the goal is. So how can we help this person or any of you um, any of your students who have these difficulties. So the first thing is students need a goal and an expected result. A lot of my students hate this part. They hate to estimate. They want to just follow the steps and find the solution. But in real life as an adult, we use estimation all the time. People don't really take, usually take calculators to the grocery store. We just kind of estimate how much things are going to cost or figure out how many bills we need to, how many dollars to take into the store. So some better ways to teach estimation are to make it fun and make it real. When I teach students in the summer, I always have a candy jar in my class every week, and we have a competition among the staff and the students for guessing how many things and for saying what strategy you use to make your estimate. And it ends up being really fun competition. And then different kids get to count them. And then I can work on counting strategies where you're not counting by ones, but counting by tens or making groups of 100. So that's really fun. I, you can probably do it virtually somehow too. But I wanted to share one I saw online recently that has to do with this COVID time. There's a website called estimation180.com. And there's also a teacher who shared her estimation station. But the one I heard um, that I wanted to share is this guy, he used his own children for an illustration in the video. But he, he measured his children to find out how tall they were. And then the assignment was to find something shorter than you and something taller than you in your house. So it was a scavenger hunt to get it and then estimate how long it was or how tall it was and then measure it and see how close you were to your estimation. And that's a really fun, that seemed like a really fun, it gets kids up and moving, they're not just looking at the screen. It would be a really good thing to include if you're doing a choice board for, um, for math. And you probably could scale it up a grade, down a grade, whatever, to do a scavenger hunt to figure out how long something is. And I find that I have trouble with that, the measuring part. Um, and the estimation part, I don't think I liked it either, but I really think it's important so that kids have a goal and know where they're going. And the other thing teachers can do, I find reference sheets or notes really useful for students of all ages. Um, check boxes and lists help students with executive function difficulties get organized across the board. I'm sure a lot of teachers know that. And then if they have reference sheets to look at, it bypasses any working memory problems so that they can focus on the application rather than the hung up on um, the small things. And it's a question how long um, they should be able to use a reference sheet. I believe that my students who are working in high school need them for tests because having the reference sheet there makes them able to use the information rather than look it up, rather than remember it. And most of the things on the reference sheet, anybody can look up at any time online. They don't have to remember it. Um, 
On the other hand, they usually fade them. Uh, the kids don't look at it once they've learned them. They know it automatically and then they don't need it. My other suggestion for reference sheets is that if they're allowed to use a reference sheet for state testing, they need to be using the same reference sheet all year from September on so that they're so comfortable with it that even when they're nervous, they know where to find the information because a lot of students are allowed to use it, but if you only start in January or February or when you're practicing for state tests, they're, they're not comfortable with the reference sheet and then they don't know where to find the information. So the, the more routinely they can use them, the better. The other thing for organizing reference sheets and notes, if you have strategies that can be applied globally or have great um, application for a whole year, and I'm gonna show you some of those, or even more than a year, those are the ones to focus on. And then the more white space they have on their reference sheets. And if the kids make them, it's better than if you make them. But if they can fold their paper in four, so that they only have four things on the page, that's better. What I find is teachers give them note pages that are very dense, and my students tend to not even read them, actually. I hate to tell you that. But if, it, if it's too many words, they don't really go through the dense language of reading them. The more white space, the better. And to that end, charts and grids really work the best. So SMARTS has a strategy. This is a triple note tote or three column notes. It can be used for any subject across the board. It can be used for vocabulary, concepts, anything. You might change the headings a little bit. So I often do topic, explanation, and visual in math. And a lot of math, actually math textbooks have three column. Oh, the old fashioned math textbooks have three column um, explanations. And I find them really helpful. For some reason, students respond really well to charts and matrices like this. Um, so here's an example of one that I've done or had students do for um, geometry with the term, the definition, and a visual or a way of remembering. So my, the visual is I would die if I had to swim across that lake so that they remember the difference between radius and diameter. But having this chart makes it really clear. Also, you can use it for homework because you can leave out one column and they have to fill in that column. You can leave out scattered boxes and have them have to fill in the scattered boxes or um, you can leave out all the terms and they have to put in the terms. And it makes another good thing for a choice board for homework. Another structure for um, vocabulary is the Freyer model, which is common in language arts, but you can use it also. A lot of my students have an example, but I have um, one of the choice board things is to explain vocabulary. But with these kind of structures, it's kind of good for them especially with the examples and the non-examples for um, different math strategies. So put in the chat any topic you're thinking, you're thinking about now that you're teaching that could be useful to use triple note tote or the Freyer model. Uh, so someone says volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, unit fractions, place value, percentages. Great, like it's really good when you do the um, fraction decimal percent and then you leave different ones out and have students fill them in. Oh, real numbers, coins. Hmm, there's gonna be some good ideas. I like it, equivalent fractions. Strategies that I was thinking yeah. of that can be used broadly that I love. The box method or array model starts in like second grade or third grade for multiplication, where you might have an array of turtles that turns into three times four equals 12. Going a little further, you can use it for um, 48 times 26 or two digit by two digit multiplication. And that same method, once the kids really have it install, installed in their brains, is really useful for algebra, for multiplying binomials, and even later in pre-calculus or 
advanced algebra, when you're multiplying a polynomial times another polynomial, I have students who just rely on this and it's so embedded in their heads, they never forget. And so if you can find whatever methods can carry on like that. I know people are very grade centric. One thing about ILD is we keep kids, like I have a student in college who I've had since third grade. So we see the growth and we see which strategies they hang on to for years. And this is another one, this is cross multiplication for proportions. I remember when my daughter was in eighth grade and she actually said to me, you know, you can use proportions for anything. And it's almost true. And it goes on for chemistry, physics, geometry. Once they use, learn that cross multiplication strategy, it's so useful for anything that has to do with parts and wholes and very useful for similarity. And when you can make the connection back to what they learned in middle school when they're in high school, remember that? It's very useful. So I'm not big on the different strategies for different kinds of percent problems. I think the point is to figure out where the X goes and use the same strategy that they can have as an anchor. I find that our kids with math learning issues need the groove to be worn really over and over and over and over again. So the more you can find one strategy that works, the better. It doesn't always promote flexibility, but it does um, build confidence and promote understanding of the concept of parts and wholes. Um, the last strategy we're going to go over is um, verbalizing the steps. And I use this every day, all day, where I, if I share a whiteboard, I'm having students tell me what they're doing and then do it and then check with my answer. And so um, yesterday I told a student to pretend I was in her brain saying, what are you going to start with, Anna? And so every time she started a problem, she asked herself, where do I start? And that, that recording is really helpful. And um, I've done it with an iPad app called Explain Everything that records what the kids say. And this is just a funny one by one of my students who was a fourth grader at the time. The fact that you need for this, you need to do, how many times does that go into 27, Sophia? Hmm, that's a very challenging question. Okay. That goes into 27, drum roll please, five times. So here I write a big chubby five. You're a genius, <laughs> Sophia. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, um, after the five, you have to do, how many leftover things are there, Sophia? The leftover things are two, so it's two fifths. Also, penguins are the best, and they're my favorite animal. So you'll know that the penguin thing is really what you wanted to talk about, but on the way, we got the math done. Um, teaching crazy phrases or acronyms for procedures is really helpful. It's controversial. You have to make sure they understand the reason for things first. But once they know the reason, a lot of our kids who struggle need to have an anchor in something that they know. So one of the visual ones is for word problems is to read and rephrase, draw something, plan and predict what you're going to do, and then solve. Just being able to do that makes students slow down and think as opposed to just adding the numbers. One that a lot of Lexington teachers are using is cubes. Um, circle the numbers, underline the question. They always have to do something your, way you're going to mark up the information so that you're having an active relationship with it, just like active reading. The so one I've used a lot is knees, and for this goes all the way again, all the way up to geometry, physics, chemistry. What do you know? What do you need to know? What equation will you use? Substitute and solve. It goes, what I like about this is it's again, multiple grade levels, multiple subjects, same basic self-questioning. And then um, making sure the students have their work organized on the page. You can provide graph paper. There's a virtual online graph paper that you can graph lines. Unfortunately, it doesn't graph points, so it's minimally useful, but good in the time of Zoom. And for your big organization, 
it's every student, every grade really should have a math strategy notebook that has their notes, their vocabulary, the strategies that work for them, their resources like a math a chart for multiplication or whatever, their quizzes that they've done, and then they should take all their work home at the end of each quarter and archive it at home in a file cabinet. So the recap you'll get, and we have, I think, five minutes for questions. So um, Michael, do you wanna manage the questions or any other things we have to tie up or things? Sure, to yeah, I'm happy to. Let me give my little like end of it spiel, and then we will um, use whatever time we have left for questions. We do wanna respect people's time. Also, I don't know, if if you have students, Joan, you might, I do. Um, okay, so uh, so this was really wonderful. Just as a reminder, this is only part one. We are just getting started with this math stuff. So uh, stay tuned for our, um, our summer calendar, which will have another free session on math, as well as some opportunities to get some hands-on stuff. So I'm putting a link to the evaluation form in the chat. Um, so go ahead and open that up. Let's just take a look at what that's going to look like. So we, so this is how you're going to be able to get your, um, you know, your sample lesson from SMARTS, if you want a certificate, all that stuff. So I need you to click on that uh, form. That will take you to the SMARTS evaluation page. This is where you can check if you want a lesson from SMARTS Secondary, SMARTS Elementary, information about upcoming trainings, et cetera. Um, one thing about certificates. So there is a fee if you need a personalized PDF certificate. If you fill out this form, you will get an email that says, hey, you, thank you for attending this. And most people can use that as proof of attendance. But if you do need a personalized certificate, um, you'll there is a $15 charge. When you submit the evaluation, you'll get a link to PayPal. When you pay the PayPal, we will send you your um, certificate. There's also some place where you can share some feedback. You know, we as educators really appreciate constructive feedback. So please do tell us what you like, what you did and where you're coming from, um, who are you and how can we kind of develop more content that supports the work that you're doing, okay? So that's what the evaluation form looks like. Um, I'll get back into the chat for one second, but I wanted to share you that word cloud. Remember you guys made that word cloud out of math? So here's what oh, you came wow. up with. Thinking, fun, fun, solving problems, difficult, reasoning, formulas, anxiety, scary numbers. You guys did a great job of really capturing what math feels like and the different pieces and parts out of it. So let me get back into the chat. Um, I'll leave this up. I'll put the evaluation back in there because I know that the link kind of gets um, thrown up, uh, pushed up on the thing. Um, one question that, oops, I put sent that just for you. One question that did come up, Joan, that I think would be an interesting one is this issue of calculators. Um, do calculators help with this sort of flexible and organized approach to math or are they a problem? What do you think about calculators? Me? Yeah. Well, like everything else, I think it depends. Um, I think if they understand the concept, I think in high school, um, if we're going to go as fast as we go through the curriculum, then curricul then calculators are necessary. If you're going to slow down the curriculum so that students have enough time to, to do the calculations by hand, then that would be a different curriculum than we have now. So I don't have a question about it for high school. When I'm working with students, when they start multiplying three times five on the calculator, I do stop them and say, wait a minute, that's not a good use of the calculator. You know three times five. But in general, if um, the other, it's, it's a question for each group really and at each grade level. I think if your focus is on the higher level problem solving, then it's okay to use the calculator. I think also they have to understand the concepts. Um, where I get uh, confused is on integers because a lot of my students never really make automatic the integer process. And therefore in high school, if they can use the calculator, they're much more, it affects their grade a lot. So I'm up for conversation about that. I don't have a definite answer and I have the same questions that you do. Yeah, 
I mean, and we've heard some interesting conversations. So let's do one more question, um, then we will have to stop. But I think the point is a lot of this is the process of supporting it and getting kids to reflect and think about it. Um, and then there's, there were also some questions. Michael, on those... some people are having trouble with the evaluation. Um... Oh, yes. Okay, I'll send it again. Sorry, I think there was a weird slash problem in the last one. So I'll put it there. Um, oops, hold on. I'll put it in there again. Also, everyone, you'll receive an email from all of us um, tonight. Everyone will get it. It will have a link to the replay, the evaluation form, and the PDF, and all of the resources. Like, or it's, Joan put so many great resources on there, so you're going to have it. Um, this last one, though, is about the um, reference sheets. So reference sheets, memorizing formulas, that kind of piece. Like, it's hard to, there are a couple different questions. One was about what categories would you recommend? And another one was about, like, is memorizing the formula, what about being able to use the formula? So how can, how can we set up reference sheets so they're as impactful as possible? Do you have any thoughts on that, Joan? It depends on the topic so much, you know? I think um, if it says a triple note tote, then you could have, this is the formula, when do I use it? And something else, how do I transform one to the other? Um, um, I think it's if it's um, just the formulas they're having trouble. Um, I think it's the when do you use it because sometimes reference sheets can be a list of things, but they're not useful because they don't know when to use it. Oh, email me. I think I put my email in. Email me at ildjsteinberg at ildlex.org if you have that specific question. I'll think about it more. And tell me what grade level you are and what topic, because I really feel like it depends. Yep. Um, that's actually an excellent segue for us to end. You know, we are really dedicated to being a resource for you guys, not just when this ends in like 30 seconds, okay? Executive function is the heart of what we do, helping educators and students and parents kind of understand executive function and develop their own strategies in their work is our mission. So don't be a stranger. We wanna hear from you with what's working, what's not. We hope that you love smarts. We hope we'll see you at a future event, but even if you don't, stay in touch. We learn from you. And, and uh, we are happy to keep sharing our great ideas as well. So everyone, um, that's it for us. I'm going to end the meeting now. We'll get that information to you later today and you know, enjoy the rest of the day. Everyone stay safe, everyone stay sane. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at a future event. And thank you so much to Joan, um, our resident math guru. Really wonderful. Thank you very much. All right, bye everybody. Bye everybody. It was a pleasure to do this. It was my first one. Thank you very much. Right, goodbye. Oh, in the end, <laughs> I'll cut this part out of the recording. All right, bye, everybody.